I just thought I'd ask all of you, if you are here, um, we are going to be talking about reclaiming narratives. I'm a, as you've heard, I'm a narrative person. And I'd like you just to think in your mind, if you were to introduce yourself in two sentences, and you were to, to connect this question of decolonization, where it hits you at home, right? The things you wake up and do every day, the books you choose to read, the programs you choose to watch, the language in which you greet your children, your friends, your neighbors, your base, whatever it is, how do you connect with this question of decolonization? I think we started with such an amazing note. I went back home yesterday and listened to Dr. Nyairo, and one of the things I appreciated about the way she, 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 it was almost like she prepared the ground for the seeds that we've been planting, to use the metaphors of what we've been through. And one of the things I really loved is that each one of us has found a challenge for ourselves. So I want to bring that home, to think about decolonization, especially now in the face of decoloniality for many of us. And decoloniality is really about the ways of thinking, of being in the world, of living that we are used to. So take a second and ask yourself, I'm going to ask this of my panel as I start. Guys, you have one sentence to talk about, this is who I am. We've had the pretty bio that we were given by Mwihaki. I am timing ourselves. So you guys have one minute. Let's see how well you'll do with that. Um, and it's as simple as saying something like this. I am passionate about the word. In my beginning was the word. And that is why, as part of my work, I link the word on page and word on stage. I am obsessed with kanga or leso. I, I research it, I teach it, I have workshops on it. If you ever want to buy me a gift, no worries, just go and buy me a leso. That's who I am. Over to you, Kiarie. Who are you? Well, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm Kiarie Kamau, and uh, I would say that I'm very passionate about African languages. Mm -hmm. What my bio did not say is that I have studied uh, Kiswahili up to master's level. I wish I could have continued uh, like Professor Kemani Jogu up to PhD level. But what I do is ensure that we publish Kiswahili books as well as as many other African language books as possible. So I would say that I resonate with African languages, African publishing and writing, speaking in African languages. Thank you. I have a question for you. You, you said, it said English, Kiswahili, Spanish? That's what Mihaki told us. Oh, it was, okay. Uh, I know who I'm coming to, because I, I have a question about if you don't speak any other African language except Kiswahili. But thank you very much. So let's go to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, just to answer you first, I do speak another African language, which mm. is Kikuyu. Mm. Okay. Uh, but indeed, I, uh, I'm, I'm checking with Europe, by the way. I am a professor of linguistics, currently at Kenyatta University. Uh, for 21 years, I taught at the University of London, School of Oriental and African Studies. And before that, I taught at Boston University. And I've also taught in Mexico City, from where I wrote the first ever Swahili Spanish dictionary, which we launched here in this Louis Leakey uh, uh, Auditorium 20 years ago. Um, so in short, yes, I am very passionate about languages. All my degrees that I've studied, academic degrees, are in linguistics, and I publish in Gekoyo, English, Swahili, and Spanish. Thank Fantastic. You. I ask that because I've only just recently learned, when people ask me what languages do you speak, I used to start with English. How many of you are like me? We start English, Kiswahili, French. Now I say Kitaita. I'm learning Kikuyu and Kenya Sign Language, and then I also speak English, French. Right? And that's the way it should be. Sunny, talk to me about yourself. Um, so my name is Sunny Dollat. Um, I'd, say that I'm, ooh, I'd say that I'm deeply passionate about um, African fashion, um, African dress, dress practice, and African textiles. Okay. Yeah. This is why he's sitting close to me. <laughs> okay. So we're going to give them a chance, just first of us, to speak to us about what they're passionate about. It's 10 minutes, gentlemen, so that we will have a chance to also have uh, go and forth. And because we ended the last panel, I'm going to change the, I was going to do it a bit differently, but we ended the last panel on the note of language and talking about African languages and the fantastic thing about um, this, this being a decade of indigenous languages. So I thought perhaps we might start with that conversation, Prof, if you don't mind. Thank you very and much. Thank welcome. You. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good, af uh, good afternoon. It's already afternoon to everyone. Um, I must begin by thanking Professor Kimani Njogu, Tuaweza, 
and the sponsors of this event today, uh, I think it is very important that we have these discussions. We often have them in class in, uh, you know, at the university, but uh, it is not often that we have the synergy from people from different uh, fields. And on that note, I quickly want to link what you just said uh, a minute ago and what others have said before. Um, they also talk about food, how important food is. It is. We all ate, we are going to eat again and again and again. But before we ate this morning, we spoke, we talked, we used language. We either said good morning to our people, and even if you're not living with other people, you may have said something to your dog or to your cat. Verbal language. So language is equally important. Um, the other point that uh, ties in very well with the previous discussions is about diversity. Diversity. We've been told about the problems facing uh, the world due to monocultivation, um, the, the grabbing or the withholding of seeds, seed material, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, diversity is good. It is what nature intended. And therefore, when we start policies of monolingualism, we are actually acting against nature. When we tell people to stop speaking all those many different languages because they are confusing to us, let's speak one language, which is English or Kiswahili for that matter, we are actually going against nature. So uh, uh, diversity is key to language. The old saying that when a library dies, uh, when an old man in Africa dies, a library dies along, a whole library is, is, is like burning down a whole library. Same thing with language. When one language dies, a whole system is dead. Now, linked to that, and that's my main thing because we have very, sh very short time to talk about this. What I'd like to say is, um, yes, we are talking about reclaiming our heritage. We are talking about bringing back, you know, uh, restitution of what has been lost. Now, true enough, a lot of things have been carried away from Africa to Europe, physically. All those artifacts they find in the museums in London or wherever. But language, language has not been taken away from us and taken abroad. It is here with us. It is us who are refusing to use it. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a difference here. Um, yes, through language policies, both colonial and post-colonial, our languages have become devalorized. We have placed more value on European languages in particular. If you look at all Africa, 2,500 languages, you can count a handful of languages that matter in Africa and they're mostly uh, European languages. You can throw in Arabic as an African language there. But all the rest of the 2,500 languages are shunted to the side because they confuse us, right? Because they are problematic. We cannot run a nation if we have uh, only one uh, so many languages. Now, talking about decolonizing, we need to decolonize our minds from that idea because that is a European idea. It is an idea in the construction of Europe. European countries that came to colonize Africa and Latin America and elsewhere, they came from monolithic backgrounds imposed upon themselves. It is not to say that there is only one language in Spain, for example, yet only one variety of Spanish language, not even the other varieties of the same language, was exported, the Castellano was exported to Latin America. So now, it is a, you know, after Chinese, it is the most widely spoken language in the world today. Now, that idea that Spain belongs to the Spanish, Spanish language is for Spain, French language is for France, German language is for Germans, and of course, English is for the English. Well, there's a question mark there because it's for British, but there are other languages therein which have been shunted to the side. Mm -hmm. Now, that project is the same one that was imposed as a colonial project in Africa. Well, you have these 60 beautiful languages of Kenya, but please put them on the side. Let's talk one language so that we can build a nation, so that we can become like Europeans. Well, it may have sound very, very sensible, but in the long term, this is as bad as monocultivation that we have been talking about today, which destroys diversity, which brings about new diseases which cannot be treated, which involves in, you know, <clears throat> endless investment, you know, buying seeds every and so on and so, so forth. So when we kill all these other languages of Africa and concentrate on one, whether it's English or Kiswahili for that matter, then we are running the danger of impoverishing the world in terms of language and cultural diversity. So in terms of decolonizing, I would say it is a conscious effort 
to scrutinize your own position and how you do it. And I think you've said it very well this morning. Examine yourself. How do you use language? Who, how, which languages do you prefer to speak most of the time? It is both a, a, a collective as well as a personal decision and effort to do. On a day-to-day -day basis, we have to continue decolonizing our minds, whether it is in our homes, whether it is in the classroom, whether it is in lecture rooms, or preaching to the converted such as yourself, I'm assuming that uh, you, you, uh, you are with me in this, in this particular area. Uh, but it is, a, is a something that has to be done on a constant basis. Secondly, most important, is fidelity, right, and cultural self-affirmation. That means valuing our Gekoyo, our Zoluo, our Ekegusi, our Kitaita, right? Actually giving it value in your own mind, because one thing that we have as a problem is, uh, uh, in terms of African languages is what I call the psychic disbelief in the possibilities of our own languages, right? How can we go to the moon? How can we make computers that speak Swahili or that can operate in, in, in Dolwo? Wow, come on, that's impossible. That disbelief, you know, the idea that you cannot argue science, you cannot argue scientifically without using a European language, this is actually where the decolonizing process must begin. We must do that. Concomitant to that, and I think in, uh, in order to address the idea of... Um, of this diversity and how to handle it, because that's a major question. Indeed, yes, we value all these languages, but how do we actually manage them? Well, multilingualism is a policy across the world. Most, many sensible countries have multilingual policies, and that means giving value, all right, valorizing not just one language, but several languages. From a scientific, scientific point of view, multilingualism, or even bilingualism, right, it is actually very good for you. When you speak two languages or three languages, you have two or three systems in your brain. You have three phonological systems, you have three semantic systems, you have three ways of argumentation. So you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot convince me or anyone who actually understands uh, language as a science that a multilingual person or bilingual person is disadvantaged in any way. In fact, many of the studies we have done indicate that good knowledge of the first language promotes the better learning of a second language, right? So in, instead of uh, what we call subtractive bilingualism, whereby we tell the kids as soon as they get into the classroom, forget your language now, Niki Ingereza or Kiswahili, right? What we need to do is practice additive bilingualism, where you are adding to the existing language, not removing one in order to replace it with another. Because as I've said, generally, human languages, you'll be amazed at their similarities. They look very, very different, and they sound very, very different. But if you look at them objectively, if you look at the syntax of most languages, if you look at the word order of all words languages, there's only like four types. Those who start with a subject and an object and a verb, those who start with a subject, with a subject and then a verb and an object, or vice versa. With a, they start with an object, go with a verb, and then a subject. But all languages in the world have those three elements. So actually, once you master one system, i.e. one language, you're actually more capable of acquiring other languages. So that's one point I would say. Now, furthermore, what we need to do is simply revert to Ngogi Wathiongo's 1981 call, decolonizing the mind. So in the process of decolonizing language, we must decolonize the mind first. And so that's why I really like this discussion because it's not only among linguists, we know what we're saying, but we can see we share a lot in common in terms of what we really need to do to the mind. So Ngoge asked in 1981, when you write, you are writing for who? Right. The reality of African languages, uh, of Africa today, is that here we sit here speaking in English, we are a tiny minority, a tiny elite minority in this country and in the con on the continent. The vast majority of Africans actually do not speak pro English to the level that we can have this kind of conversation. The day-to-day -day activities across Africa, I would dare you to tell me that they do not happen in mostly in African languages. Once we step out of this NMK today, out there, we will not be speaking English, most likely. We will be speaking Kiswahili, Sheng, Gekoyo, Dolu, whatever it is. So the reality of the fact is, we like to believe that we, English is a savior for us. But actually, 
It is a savior for a tiny minority. It also acts to isolate the larger, the, 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 the larger groups from ourselves because they cannot follow this discussion. They cannot understand what we are saying. Bank Bose in Nigeria over the years has done many studies and demonstrated very clearly, even in Nigeria, English-speaking nation, Commonwealth country with very close links to, to Britain and so forth, he concluded that less than 25% of Nigerians actually are competent in English. They are probably very competent in Nigerian Pidgin English, which is a variety of English that is indigenous. Now we are talking about indigenous systems, and that's my next and probably last point, that the vast majority of us actually use African language. So why should we insist that, um, you know, why, why can we not see the easiest thing to do is to revert to the use of African languages? So because of, uh, of, of time limitations, um, all I could say is that um, what we need to do, there are several things that we must do. We must sit down and catalog our African languages. That dictionary I presented here 20 years ago, I have not seen a follow-up. You know, that's a 20-year gap between a dictionary and another. Big languages of the world, they have vast numbers of dictionaries. And you cannot ever finish writing dictionaries. And therefore, it's important that we have, not just as in English, not just the Oxford University Dictionary, you have the Cambridge University Dictionary, you have Webster's for the Americans, you have et cetera, et cetera. The same language, huge volumes and ongoing material. In fact, uh, so the online dictionaries such as the Oxford English Dictionary, they're actually now taking our language and making it English. <laughs> so when you go to the Oxford English Dictionary today online, you will find the words matatu, boda boda, all right? I think you even find Buddha. Huh? <laughs> so this is what we are talking about. We must catalog, we must take that effort ourselves. That languages are not like artifacts. They're not just artifacts that we can keep, keep in a museum. Somebody said it here. Culture is like a river. It is dynamic. It is ongoing. Um, returning to the roots, part of it also means translation. Retranslation is very important. I think recently Ngogi Wathiyong has declared that he is now sitting down to retranslate all his works, re return them back to the original Gikoyo that he intended to write with, but he couldn't at the time. So that is part of decolonization. That all the books, I have not seen the one book that was cited here, Facing Mount Kenya, a seminal book for at least for one, you know, the first probably ethnography by an African of an African community, 1938. I have not seen it in Kikuyu. It is in, in, in Kiswahili, which is good, but it is not in Kikuyu, which is the language uh, of, the, of the people being studied. Three, we must elevate the role and value of orality. Okay? Now, the, 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 the era we are living in, of the digital era and so forth, is clearly telling us that the written word is not the final word, is not the only word, okay? Books now do not have to be in this format. They can be in oral form, they can be uh, in digital form. Audio books are plentiful in English from all over parts of the world. We can concentrate on that because our languages are largely oral. When you put Gikuyu or Dolwo, uh, well, or one of the tone languages on, on script, you are losing a lot. The prosodic features of the language, the tones, right? They are completely lost by re being reduced into writing. But when you're saying it, it comes through. So we must do that, raise the value, just like the 1970s movement elevated the word orator and removed the dirtiness of oral literature to make oral literature mainstream. In the same way, we need to say that spoken language is as valuable as the written language. And we must make use, therefore, of these opportunities offered by modern technology, the media, and so on and so forth. Finally, I, no, not finally, I could say a lot more, but... <laughs> I need you I, to... <laughs> yes, I have to say that the role of not just scholars, I have had scholars being mentioned here very much. Of course, we are the first in the line of uh, attack, right? Because we are supposed to produce ideas. But in terms of language, I can assure you that not just researchers, but teachers, right? language practitioners, writers, poets, you know, dramatists. These people are also equally important in maintenance and promotion of our languages. So I will not even get into the main point, which was we must get these languages back into our curriculum. The CBC is making attempts, but I am still yet to see Kenyatta University offering any 
African language other than Kiswahili. We are doing very well in Kiswahili, both in Nairobi and elsewhere, and Pwani and, and, and all universities, but none of them seems to be offering any other African language. That is a problem. Thank you. Chapter sana, sana, sana. Okay. And I just want to give a shout out. We talked about verbal, we talked about written. Yes. And we have I, I, all, all this, um, I've been following what's going on with the sign language interpreting. And I think it's important for us to also start to think about languages that are signed, that our bodies yes, are, are happily doing. So thank you. Let me give a sign out, a shout out to the sign language interpreters. I will come back to you at the end. I was going to ask you this now, but I know we've run over your time, so I'm going to bring you to the questions. That question of the, the, lang the decade, and also that Kiswahili now has a day that the whole world celebrates, yes. and is that just token, but does it have meaning? But let me come to this question um, of books. Of, of, you know, you know how guys, you go out to buy a book for your child. I'm going to come back to this little publication which I want to talk about, which the museum is selling of Meketilili. And you don't find proper nice books that are us. You know, the one your child picks up and wants to read. They are good pictures. These, these are the stories of us. And I want to ask what we are doing about that. Mm. Karibundugu. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think. Uh, it's a bit disconcerting to talk after Professor Shege Gezira, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> an expert in linguistics, a scholar for that matter, for many years. But I'm happy, at least, he has uh, left one side, that is uh, publishing, writing, and so on, uh, for me. Let me uh, resonate with what he has just talked about, uh, uh, you know, treatise, Decolonizing the Mind that uh, the whole process of uh, decolonization of the mind, uh, reclaiming our identity, you know, going back to the roots, must start with the language. And I want to quote what he says, uh, you know, his clarion call, that uh, if you know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, and then you perfect it, on top of it, you add other languages, English, uh, Spanish for that matter, French, and so many other languages, that is empowerment. But if you do not know uh, the language of your culture, you do not know your mother tongue, but you are an expert in all those other languages, that is enslavement. So the clarion call is we go for empowerment. Let us empower our people. Let us empower the learners. Let us empower the children. And how do we empower them? I think it has to start right from the roots. I always uh, have this uh, argument, especially in uh, social places, about names and uh, identity and so on and so forth. And when somebody asks me, what is your first name? I say, Kerry. No, no, no. I want to know your first name. Say, my first name is Kerry. So when we look at it in a broader sense of the word, in Africa, or other in African society, when a child is born, let me give the example of uh, among the Age Koyo, because it is very known, the naming system. When a child is born, if it is a boy, straight away, you know, the name is XYZ. If it is a girl, the name is Y. So there is no time that a child is born as a boy and then the mother exclaims, wow, it's a boy, this is John, it's a boy, this is Lawrence, it's a boy, this is Smith. It is an African name. It is already known. There is no argument about it. The same applies to language. You are born into a specific or a certain language uh, setup, your mother tongue, or the language of your culture. So the responsibility, first and foremost, lies among the parents, the guardians, the people who are interacting with that child as it grows. And some of those people are also the teachers. But then the teachers might ask, well, we want 
to progress it. But where are the materials? What are the publishers doing? What are the authors doing? What are the distributors, uh, booksellers for that matter, doing? And I want to say, uh, practically uh, speaking, not much has been done, especially in Africa. Not many people have uh, taken the risk of investing in publishing of books in indigenous African languages, purely because of one, the aspect of colonization, the aspect of enslavement, the aspect of lack of the desire to reclaim our culture, and culture starts with the language. I have uh, uh, brought with me a couple of books here. They are textbooks in various languages spoken in Kenya. We have Gekoyo, we have books in Doluo, Ekegusi, Kikamba, Kigiriyama, Lologoli, and others which are not here, but uh, uh, they are available even in bookshops. And I want to mention that apart from uh, these books uh, in uh, African languages spoken in Kenya, we have also done language, seven languages in Zambia. We have done books in Kenya, Rwanda. And we are set to do books in virtually every language that is spoken in Kenya. We talk about 42, but before we close that gap, somebody comes and says, no, 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 you must segment this from uh, uh, the other one. But now, the uh, professor has uh, talked about the issue of curriculum, the CBC. And I want to say that the CBC is trying to mainstream African languages, teaching of African languages at the lower levels, first and foremost, progressing to higher levels up to colleges and universities. But it is starting now at grades one, two, three. The Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, and uh, I don't know perhaps uh, whether there is a representative of KICD here, uh, called for submissions way back in 2017, 2018, for people to submit books in various uh, local languages. Submissions were done. Another call has been done recently, actually within this month of uh, March, because it is geared towards ensuring that the levels of grade one, two, three have got the right materials, the right books, the right learning and teaching materials in indigenous languages for all the languages that are spoken in Kenya. But what is the flip side? Is that we have uh, distributed the books far and wide. The uptake is not very promising. And as a commercial publisher, uh, you know, there are so many questions that will be asked by the board and even the shareholders, the rationale of investing in an area that is not bringing a return on investment. But you see, the return on investment could be in monetary form, but at the same time, in form of uh, the philosophical, uh, cultural, sociological aspect of it is very important. At the end of the day, there will be the coin you know, uh, coming, but have we invested culturally? Mm -hmm. I want to... Uh, Go back also to the issue of uh, politicizing the whole aspect of uh, African languages and saying that encouraging the teaching of African languages, the diversity that uh, Professor talked about, is encouraging tribalism, which is very unfortunate because that is just in, uh, in the mind. There is no time that speaking one's language would be encouraging uh, tribalism. There is no way that identifying with one's language group would encourage tribalism. Rather, it would encourage cultural diversity. It would encourage that pride of belonging, the pride of place. Which brings me also to the area of now 
from there, how do we innovate in Doluo, in Kikamba, in Kigiriyama, in Kipokomo, and those other languages? And I think the best example is the Japanese and the Chinese. Most of the products that we are using here in Kenya come from China. And I look at sometimes even the, you know, the instructions that are given in broken English, but the fact of the matter is that we are using them. They have innovated. They have used their own language, cultural belonging, to come up with solutions, technological solutions, among so many other solutions. They are distributing those solutions all over the world. They are earning from those solutions. And in order to share, they are investing in English, not necessarily to perfect it, but at least to say this is how to apply this particular uh, product. That is what we should do in African languages. In our endeavor to distribute these books, I do remember there was a session at Maseno University, and one of the professors mentioned that uh, even in the area of medicine, often one goes to hospital and you want to explain to the doctor what is ailing you. And you will talk about the pain that is starting from this part, goes down, concentrates on a certain part, then down and so on and so forth. That is best explained in a language that one understands well. And the person you are explaining to will get the gist of uh, the matter. So what are we saying? That uh, let us support the teaching, the learning, the speaking of African languages. Let us invest in distributing of the same. Let us invest in encouraging our children to learn here and in the diaspora. And how do we do that? Apart from what I have just talked about, when you go to social media uh, platforms, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on and so forth, there is a prolifer proliferation of enthusiasts of African languages doing short skits, encouraging plays, and so on and so forth. The proliferation of TV stations and FM stations uh, stations in indigenous languages. I would like to see the current, uh, you know, uh, analysis, statistics of the viewership of, let's say, Inoro TV vis-a-vis -vis other TV stations in English that broadcast in English and Kiswahili. I would not be surprised that they surpass because people resonate with that message that, you know, speaks, you know, to the heart speaks to what they do understand. So thank you very much. I would wish to say more. I have so many books, so much to talk about here in other African countries, what we have done, the challenges, the excitement, because it is there. We could not have uh, done all this if there were no uh, buyers and much more. Thank you very much. Sia Bonga. And I will come back to you and I will ask you the question of what you just said in terms of affordability. And as I say that, I'm going to ask that you start to bring up, please, Sunny's slides. I went to the museum bookshop before this because I absolutely love, and if you haven't gone and seen the Heroes of Kenya Gallery, please, please, please do that. And I wanted to buy the books. And I was told that this booklet is going for 600 shillings, Whoa. right? And I thought about all the kids who come here, like literally thousands, mm. and how any child who goes to that, that, that uh, exhibition will come out and say, I want to buy that story. I want a book to go home with. But many of them will not afford this at 600. And I was told it's because to get the quality of this, right, the color, the everything, that's why it costs so high. So I want to come back to you and say, apart from the textbooks, think about, you know, how, how can we put these books in the hands of every Kenyan child in all the languages, not just in English, in, in Kidavida, in Kiturkana, the whole range of them? Sunny, we are talking about language, 
And language is also in, in, in clothing, in accessories. Mm -hmm. um, kangas, of course, famously have words on them. You know, I'm so obsessed, guys. Buy kangas for your mothers, your sisters, your aunties, for yourselves. But talk to me about clothing and accessories. Absolutely. Um, so there's a quote um, by the very prolific Ghanaian artist, Elan Atsui, that I always really love to share um, whenever talking about African textiles and clothing. And it says um, that textiles are to Africans what monuments are to Westerners. And for me, that quote has always been really important to help us understand um, the role and the position and, and the centrality of textiles. Because I think that today it's so easy to think about textiles and, and, and the fashion space as very frivolous, right? Um, whenever we see people who like to put uh, effort in, in dressing up, um, there's always some very kind of like odd remarks. So like, you're looking nice, where are you going today? You know? Um, but really when you think about it, this, this, uh, this dress practice and this kind of like showing up and, and, and almost performing is such a key element in many African cultures. Um, and so when, we, when we're speaking about reclaiming, and I guess this is a good time to kind of go through the slides. Um, <clears throat> there's another quote actually um, that I'd like to share. So in 2020, um, Shoma Josie, who some of you may know, um, is a very famous South African uh, artist. Um, she gave a keynote at Design in Daba, and during um, her presentation, she, sh she said, we shouldn't uh, muse muse museumify our culture. And I don't think museumify is a, cult is, is a word, but it, it does the now. thing. <laughs> it now is now. <laughs> we shouldn't museumify our culture, we should live it. And I think that, for me, that quote, again, is such, a, is such a key thought when we talk about reclaiming, is that it's so easy when we're looking at clothing and accessories to interact with cultural heritage from a very kind of like distance place. So we go to the museum and we see photos of all of this incredible um, ceremonial dress and, and traditional dress. And so, you know, you see it in the museum, you see the photos of it, and maybe you see it on a mannequin, and then, and then you leave. But um, I think that it's, it's in fact a matter of urgency that we interact with this culture and with this cultural memory um, without the glass. And I wanted to just highlight the work of, of, of some um, creatives across the continent who for me are really doing a, a phenomenal job at um, some of this reclamation. So this is a, this is a, a, a songa skirt called the Zibelani. Um, what's interesting about this skirt is that this silhouette um, exists in many, many African uh, cultures across the continent, um, including here in Kenya, uh, but in Saiso. Um, it's been interesting to see the way that creatives across South Africa have been interacting with this skirt. So as I said, Shoma Josie um, famously uses this skirt while performing on stage. Um, I think pretty much every single performance, um, at some point she'll wear this skirt. Um, and then <coughs> on the right-hand side at the top, we have a photo um, of the designer Rich Mnisi, who also made his own iteration of this skirt. Um, and then below that we have a um, South African product and furniture a company called Mashti Design, who again used the silhouette of this skirt to create this really beautiful um, light pendant. And I think that again, when we're looking at and interacting with these things that were used way before our time, um, as opposed to just kind of like upholding it as, as cultural memory, as cultural heritage, it's important for us to think about how we can interact with it now. So how are we able to, 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 to interact with this, with this object um, and make them applicable in the context in which we exist? And I think that that's why the example of, the, of this, and it's called the tutu lampshade, is such a phenomenal example, is that like, maybe you don't necessarily have somewhere to wear this fantastic Zibelani skirt, you know, but that you can buy this lampshade and still be able to, 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 to honor your, your heritage, to honor um, your kind of like ancestral lineage by having this, this, this shade. Um, locally, we have this um, really famous Swahili uh, plaster work called Zidaka that's found uh, along the coast. And in 2018, the Kenyan um, designer Nyango Mpinga did a really beautiful collection um, and kind of centered the motif of this Zedaka um, in the prints um, of the collection. And she made all of these amazing dresses and, and, and tops and, and scarves. And again, you know, we live in Nairobi. You don't really find Zedakas anywhere. 
there's a couple of restaurants that, that, that may have it. But let's say you are born in Lamu and you want to be able to, to honor that in some way, um, and you've moved into some apartment somewhere in Kilimani, and you cannot negotiate with your landlord on how to put in a, a zidaka in your house. But at least then Anyango <laughs> gives us the opportunity to, to, to honor this heritage, um, that you can go in and buy a, a scarf, and you can go in and you can buy a, um, a, a, a blouse, right? And then, and then lastly, fam and perhaps probably the most famous is, um, so in South Africa, there's a tribe called the Ngosa, um, who are also quite famous for their beadwork. And, and I think now it's maybe about 11 years ago, there's a designer called Laduma, um, who created a brand called Mang Mangosa, um, which is actually what I'm wearing. Um, and, and this started really as a, as a, as an academic exploration. So Laduma's Ngosa, and when, when, when Ngosa boys reach, reach a certain age, they're given an initiative uh, gift of knitwear. And so Laduma's whole thinking um, was, okay, how can we kind of update this gift of knitwear um, and kind of, you know, bring in a couple of elements? So you have this thought of, of creating something um, that can replace this traditional knitwear that used to be given. Um, and also referencing this Ngosa beadwork. And he created this brand, Mangosan, um, which is now incredibly famous, and they've been able to venture out into uh, homeware, so you can see a picture of like some carpets, um, and to women's wear and men's wear. Um, and again, that's such a great example of being able to, to visit heritage and, and, and kind of like translate it, interact with it, and, and give the public um, an offering that, that uh, they can use in this day and age that makes sense um, in this context. Um, and because of time, I think I'll stop there. Oh, wow. Okay, that's just so amazing. And of course, I want you to just keep going on. But, because um, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about, and I said I work, my research is on yeah. Kanga, and, or Leso, and you know, there's a reason why we use Leso and Kanga, and which one is more Kenyan? How many of you know? Is it Leso, hands up? I can tell you. Kanga, hands up. <laughs> Okay, find that out. There's a reason that we use Leso on one side and Kanga on the other, but now we all use Kanga and there's a story. But really, when you wear your, your Kanga, this is a century worth of history that you're carrying on your body. Mm -hmm. When you wear a Kanga that's been for a special location, you're carrying your people with you. This Kanga was given to me by my mother. I'm carrying her with me. And there are all ways in which talking of language, talking of literature, talking of orature, the texts that we carry with us. I love the idea of a lampshade, right? That you are saying, I may be sitting in Nairobi, but here are my people with me. Um, just the ways in which we bring this into your space. All the jewelry I'm wearing today comes to me from a place and there's a story behind it. And I'm saying that because I want you to think about what you're wearing. And whether you just took a picture, put it on Twitter and said, I'm going for a small meeting in the morning, and we all know what that means. So I have questions for you. I had questions, I've put them in the room. The question that I would like to ask you is what happened to this National Dress Project? Mm. Every five, 10 years, we get this passion. We are creating a national dress. It's showcased, we all celebrate, nobody buys it, and then five years again, another generation comes and says we are creating a national dress. Mm. So I want them to think of those three questions and open out to you. Who has questions on language? Who has questions on clothing? Who has questions on accessories? I see one hand right at the back, and a second one, and a third one. Let me take those three questions. We'll come back and answer the six questions on the table, and if we have time, we'll go back. Um, Mwihaki, I'll keep an eye on you. If you have questions online, I'll come to you next. So um, the three questions. Guys on this side, have we intimidated you, scared you? OK, I'll come to this side next. Start there. Hi Thank everyone. Habari zenu? Muko fiti. Sijui nitumie shank pia. Nice. Uh, my name is Paul Mbugwa. I'm a content producer and script writer. Mine is a comment on the tribalism point of uh, our cultural languages. And what I would like to say is tribalism is a political term. It's not social, it's not economical. So as Africans, tribalism is not part of us. It's a political term to divide us, mostly when elections come, okay? 
So thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you very much. <laughs> As the mic moves, that's a really heavy point. Mm. The political, the politicization of these identities. Mm. Let's just be thinking about that. Next. Um, thanks. It's a really quick one to, I guess, Professor Gethiora. Is there a term that has been coined for that cognitive dissonance that we feel so, like Asani was saying, maybe I want to feel smart, right? I know intellectually that uh, maybe this is smart, right? But the politics of the office, all of that like really tells me that I need to go towards Western clothes or I want to have a really deep conversation. So I default to English, even though I know in my heart that maybe I could have had that conversation in, let's say, Kikuyu or Kiswahili. Have you or other scholars of African language coined a term to kind of define that cognitive dissonance we feel as Africans? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And see, we're going back to that idea of the decolonization of our mind, your own personal mind. Go thank, ahead. Thank you very much. Once again, I'm Pirich Yakot. Uh, this is my question. Uh, I want us to ask ourselves, how do we bring in the younger generation, our generation, my generation, when it comes to language. For example, I'm a mother of three girls. It's a shame that my girls cannot speak Luo. And, you know, they need to speak Luo. Then another thing, if you ask most these young people who are here, wakienda ushago, atisasa watu waonge lugha yao. Oh my God, I didn't understand. Uh, I can't speak it well. You know, uh, we think it's fancy that we can speak good English and say, you know what, girl? I mean, that is not us. So my, my, my real question is, how do we bring this generation? Because if we lose it right now, it's going to be very difficult to bring it back. Thank you. Eroka Mano, you've got six questions, and then we'll come back to those guys. Right. Uh, who start? Shall I? Okay, um, sh shall I start with those ones there? Yeah, yes. I mean, it's not. That's mine. <laughs> yes, I'll yes. come back okay. to that, yeah, Let's if I can ahead. remember it. Yeah. <laughs> right, um, thanks very much. Um, in, a, in a short um, response, um, I, I, it's actually not a, a cognitive issue. It's not cognitive dissonance as you, you're describing it. This is a sociological problem, okay? It is a problem of power versus solidarity. That's how we make language choices. Do you want to be more powerful than the interrupter? Yes. Then you speak English. Do you want to be solidary with the person you're dealing with? Yes. So you speak Swahili, Sheng, or the mother tongue that you have, right? So it is really these stances we make. They are conscious, sometimes unconscious, but they can be explained very easily. And that's why I started by saying that this colonization, at, at some point, it is really a very individual enterprise. And that leads to the question about how do we teach our children language? Because you can say your children do not speak proper Tholwo right now, but I bet there's somebody else of your same age and possibly same demographic whose children actually speak Tholwo. Okay? So there's an element of how do you want to project, project yourself? In Kenya and in Africa generally, the language of power is the ex-colonial language. English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, whatever you want. Okay? That's how you get jobs. That's how you become an engineer. That's how you become rise in government, because of your good English, not because of your good Kikuyu or good, good, good Dolwo or your good uh, Ekegusi. And so once we make these choices, the matter is left to the individual. Now, of course, policymakers have a role to play. You can nudge people in certain directions. Okay? And that means offering incentives, right? Offering uh, the idea that there is benefit in the use of mother tongue. The example uh, Mr. Kiri has brought up here is excellent. The so-called vernacular radio stations, they have proven beyond doubt that our languages can do as much as well as English or Kiswahili. Okay? I see doctors giving up, you know, their views on Inoro. I see politicians coming on board. I see intellectuals. I've seen the vice chancellor of the University of Nairobi explaining why the university is having trouble in very clear, ordinary language that the vast majority of the speakers who are interested can understand. They made those choices. Okay? They made a choice to speak in that language because they want to express solidarity with the, the people they're interacting with. But when you want to express power, English is your choice. Then you show the people, I'm above you. 
I'm more learned than you are. I've got a better job. I am a professor. You are not. Mm. <laughs> wow. And that is so true. And we academics, <laughs> we like you. If you don't call me Dr. Mshaya, I look at you like, uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> y yes, uh, mine is a quick one. I just wanted to respond to the lady who has uh, asked about the younger generation. You know, what do they, uh, what will they do? And I want to say that uh, when we went to town, you know, to say we have published indigenous language books in the foreign languages, we started getting enquiries and uh, I was quite amused by two of those enquiries because, uh, you know, somebody calls or writes and uh, says, you know, I want uh, books in this particular language. So when I followed, you know, what is the age of the child? person hesitated and said, actually, I am the one who wants the books. <laughs> so, but I encourage them, there is nothing to be shy about, you know. If you missed out those early years, and you want to pick up later, that is actually empowerment. So we do encourage that uh, as much as these books are labeled grade one, grade two, mm -hmm. grade three, and so on and so forth, they are for learners across the board who want to learn that language. And we want to take them to the next level of introducing virtual lessons. Mm. Uh, just an additional point, not necessarily from the questions that have come, is that uh, we are also encouraged by the proliferation of others. There are so many people who are writing to us, I have developed this particular storybook, this poetry book, this curriculum book for this language, and I want you to publish. It is publishers who do not have the capacity to handle that proliferation of so many others and so many publishable books. Thank you. And let me just say, I'm learning Kenya Sign Language through a WhatsApp class. So mm. it's wonderful how we are opening up these spaces. I do want you at some point, Kakakiare, to address the question, what can we do, us, not just you, yeah. to make these books more affordable to more of us? Yeah. But Sunny. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll take your question on, on, the, on the national dress. Um, I think that the process for the national dress was, has been in many ways um, an impossible task. Um, I think it was two years ago when I discovered that the sunlight uh, national dress search was actually the third attempt at finding a national dress. The first one was shortly after independence, there's another one in the 90s, and then the sunlight one. And so what's clear is that as Kenyans, we will keep on coming back to this thing mm. because how do you show up to a space as a Kenyan? Mm. If you're Ethiopian, you can, show up, you can show up in a Shema, Nigerian, you can show up in a Nagbada, Ghanaian, you show up in Kente, but as a Kenyan, how do you show up um, and occupy space um, and declare um, via your dress choices that you're a Kenyan? Um, what's really interesting is that a, a placeholder in the meantime appears to be the wristband. Mm. Um, and that it happened so quietly, and it has its problematics, but it's, it's kind of holding that space. So sometimes you'll be like walking in like a random street in Germany, and you're like, hey, yeah, you're a Kenyan. <laughs> um, and that that then be becomes this kind of like moment for you to, to, to interact and appreciate that. Um, that said, I think that that process for the Sunlight National Dress Search doesn't get enough credit. Um, because it was such a well thought out uh, um, process. Yes. Because what they did is that they went and interacted with all the communities across the country and they distilled into essences what they found um, occurring similarly mm -hmm. in, all the in all the majority of the communities across the country. Um, I think where the issue became, where the issue came was that, um, and this is where for us tribal politics get in the way, is that the, the minute something started to lean a bit too much towards one tribe, people were like, I, I'm not, I, I can't. <laughs> it is not me who will wear the it. The politics. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so then, you know, in, in 2000, I think that was back in 2007, 2006, is that at that time, how do you create something that every single tribe of our 43, 44 tribes, we'll be like, okay, I see myself in that. And so you can see how there's, th there is something slightly impossible about that. And what's also easy to forget is that all the other national dresses and national um, outfits that we always reference um, didn't need the same amount of consensus. So when you look at the Agbada, 
it is not a Nigerian dress. Like, yes, now it can be referred to as a Nigerian dress, but it was it first. The... Exactly. It first came from the Yoruba. Mm. Same thing with the Kenta cloth. The Kenta cloth is an Ashanti cloth. Mm. Um, and I think that that's something that needs to be negotiated. And I'm pretty sure that in another something years, we will do another search for a national dress and that we will not stop until we are able to find something that, that we can hold and, and, and embrace um, and show up in and be able to declare our Kenyanness. Lesso. Every Kenyan woman has a lesso. You gentlemen, look for yourselves. I'm coming to the audience. I have two questions. One, two, three. Muyaki, do you have questions? Thank you very much for that lovely presentation. Uh, my question is for Sunny. And um, when, when you showed us the different fabrics from the different countries, um, how come you didn't mention the work that you've done around textile explorations and the fabric that you did? So it, would it be possible for you to tell us a little bit more about that process and sure. what, what it means for you as a Kenyan? The famous ca Kenyan culture of, sh of being humble, <laughs> that is what you have just seen displayed. You've been called on it. Thank you. Um, my question goes to any one of you, and it has to do with the commodification of our identity. When you talk about um, us having to learn our languages, which is a good thing, and it being published, it now has to create this product which has copyright or some patent or trademark on it, which then hikes the price, and then it makes me question why, why is my language and my identity having to be sold for me to learn it? And so this quest, the tension between knowledge sharing and um, intellectual property and the economics surrounding all that, I'd really love to hear a comment from you. Thank you, you very much. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Musani Kimani Wanjiro. Um, and my question, um, I would like to direct my question to, or thoughts to KK and Prof. Um, there, is, uh, there is probably a very valid and uh, philosophical reason why, for instance, ancient Egypt, for writing and languages, they were using hieroglyphics. And uh, the power about visuals, uh, the beauty about visuals. And uh, that's why even currently you find um, the younger generation has embraced emojis and, and so on. There's something about uh, visuals. And I want to connect this with uh, a pet subject that uh, I, you know, really, really, really uh, passionate about. And that's uh, the space and place of comics and uh, graphic novels. Uh, in Kenya, are those books you're doing, um, have you considered them even if in the, um, uh, for, for, for the younger generation? And, and that's where I'm giving the connection of uh, visuals, uh, doing them in uh, comics, because uh, to be honest, uh, we're not doing very well in that area of comics and graphic novels and graphics storytelling uh, in Kenya, uh, um, probably the region. Thank you. Thank you. And as the mic comes um, forward, thank you, Kimani, for that question, because it also brings the question of visual language. This morning, we heard of how we, it's right here to the front there. We, we, we had um, moved from writing Kiswahili from the Arabic script to the Roman script. And I wonder if we could create our own script. I know I saw a lot of Africans beginning to jump off Black Panther and that Wakanda script and beginning to discover, because we always say Africans are oral people, and that's true, but we also were illiterate people, and we can create, just as we've created Kenya Sign Language, so that's something I'm always thinking about, but yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mshai. Oh, okay, sorry, I thought he can see me because I'm seated at the front, but let me stand. Um, so thank you so much for the wonderful discussions um, and um, being a poet who uh, writes on uh, using um, Gekoyo as my mother tongue and in different other languages. Um, it has been very enlightening uh, listening to you. So I had a question for Sani. Uh, I'd like you to um, sort of give a comment and your observations on the reclaiming of Ankara. It's something that I've seen 
happening a lot in, in, in Kenya. There's a time when you know, you'd be invited for a wedding and only two people showed up, but now suddenly it's everywhere and it's suddenly become acceptable. If you could take us through that, what has been happening, what were the triggers and things like that, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. And also the use of the, of the, of the brown um, attire. I have a name for it uh, in, my, in my mother tongue. Uh, so it's the, 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 the dress that ladies wear for weddings. I, I'm sure all of us know, but it's called Muego and uh, Moduru. So those are the ones that you see in a lot of Kikuyu traditional uh, in Kikuyu weddings. So it's becoming common. So maybe if you could speak on that. And the last question is to Professor uh, Gidiora. Um, so we've seen a lot of use of uh, borrowing of uh, terms from other communities and it's becoming sort of like the, the default term. So I'll, 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 I'll refer to this particular one, Roratio. Uh, it's been used in, by every Kenyan to refer, and everyone knows what it is in reference to, but we don't use the English name. I'm, I'm curious about that, and if that's something that we can sort of lean towards in a way to sort of decolonize ourselves and just look at that and see. We're already heading that way. We might, you know, how else can we sort of move in that direction? Thank you. Okay. We have yes. We have two questions from our online audience. First from Jacqueline Wangi, who says, on the decolonization agenda, do you think Kenya is doing enough to promote the Swahili language? First, as our national language. Second, as a way to promote our culture. And then also use it potentially for cultural diplomacy with other nations internationally. The second question comes from Georgia Rabu, and he uh, makes an observation about how uh, when Kenyans switch to mother tongue, it could be divisive or it could be seen as disregarding others. So when is it a good time to use mother tongue, especially when it comes to public forums and cosmopolitan setups? Shukriya to all of you. I'm really sorry that we can't take any more questions. We are actually already over time. So please make your closing comments. These guys are here. They're not allowed to go before lunch ends. So for those of you who are here, make sure you grab them. For those of you who are online, I'm sure our hosts will find ways of keeping these conversations going. So. Kakakaribuni Nyote, who wants to start? I can start. Um, and I can respond to, th to the first question. Um, I <laughs> yes, I've been caught. Um, so <sighs> it's such a big project. But um, kind of going back to this idea of, of a national dress, I had been curious, perhaps, um, that what might be interesting to investigate is uh, a, a Kenyan textile. And so in 2020, I uh, set out this, this uh, project called Nanga, um, which uh, many of you know means, means anchor. And for me, the reason for that name was that I really see uh, textiles as a, as a tether um, to, to, to cultural memory, to cultural heritage. Um, and the approach to that textile project was around investigating and trying to find uh, a visual language um, to develop a print, printed textile that can um, stand up and rival Ankara. And I'll answer the Ankara question in part at this moment, because I think that, and, and, and for me certainly, I'd really spent a long time criticizing Ankara and highlighting the problematics, but I also found myself asking myself, okay, so it what's the solution, you know? Um, it's easy to criticize, but okay, so what is the offering? Um, so around this investigation on visual, visual language and motive. Um, I worked with um, two, two graphic designers, so Lulu, Lulu Kitololo and, and Monica Obaga, um, to develop um, motives that can be uh, transferred onto textile. And so we finished and released the project in September of last year, um, with a total of about five prints. Um, so Nandi Flame, there's a Matatu print, there's one that's inspired by um, henna uh, motifs and patterns that are found in the coast, and there's one that's inspired by um, corn, uh, maize. Um, and that whole process was so interesting because, you know, you look at so, at so much material and you try and find um, a motif that really captures the Kenyan experience, that when people see the motif, they're able to see themselves, they're able to see the experience honored, um, and that I think that I can say that we did that fairly successfully. I think for me, the thing that was particularly interesting was the response to the project. And so we released the, the, the project, and, and true to this same style, I think we 
put up a post on Instagram and like, okay, so here is some fabric and, you know, we put it in a store in Westlands. Um, and I don't think I've ever quite had a response like that to anything that I've put out. But the fabric sold out in an hour. Wow. Um, and for me, that was incredibly humbling um, and also incredibly validating because what then happened was the conversations and, and the messages that we got up until now um, have been so beautiful to, to, to read and to experience because people have been buying the fabric out of this like, deep sense of patriotism. Um, and you know, someone will call you and tell you and say thank you um, because I'm able to see myself in this textile. And I think that that's the thing that we've never been able to see with Ankara because remember that we were never the primary market for Ankara. In fact, Africa was never the primary market for Ankara. Um, what happened is that um, the Dutch set out to make Ankara to sell in, um, and actually Dutch wax to be specific, to sell in Indonesia, which at the time was a Dutch colony. The Indonesians looked at it and said, uh uh, this quality we reject. And so the Dutch were able to find a secondary market in West Africa. And that for the longest time, um, West Africa remained the primary market um, for Dutch wax. And because of that, a lot of the symbols and motives that, that existed in, in wax print resonated in that area. So you, you see like a print of a, of a bird. Um, when it comes here, you're like, okay, this, no this nice birds, okay, great. But then in Nigeria, in Ghana, that bird means something. Um, and so as Kenyans, we've never been able to see ourselves kind of like captured in this motive language. And I think that that was also, that was really, really interesting. Um, and it's an on ongoing project. And that on the other hand, um, again, this idea of Kenyanness, because it's, it's, it really is, can be quite difficult. Um, another part of the project, which isn't quite publicly available yet, but it was more of an artistic exploration, is that, okay, so when you think about Kenyanness, if the, if the kind of like tribal politics are, are difficult to, to navigate, um, what happens if you remove the tribal politics and you remove people? And so, uh, we did some work with a couple of um, textile mills, so Tosheka in Wate and Beacon of Hope um, up in Rongai, and we did two different um, sustainable textiles. So one was woven out of sisal and cotton, and the other one was woven out of airy silk and cotton. Um, and with the airy silk and cotton one, what we did was um, to think about Kenya as a place and to think about the land and the soil as a holder of memory. Um, so we finished the textile, and we buried the textile over a period of a couple of days. And what I was particularly interested in is to be able to, again, capture the memory of the, of the earth and the, and the memory of the soil, and also give the land an opportunity to imprint itself onto this textile. Because for me, that textile is <coughs> undeniably Kenyan, because it holds the memory and the fingerprint of the land. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a very kind of like artistic exploration. And I really apologize that there are no images, but there, I assure you the images are somewhere. You're going to uh, have to make this more of this <laughs> available. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I just want to say something about the aspect of uh, commodification or for that matter, commercialization of uh, our languages. I want to say, uh, yes, uh, she has a point. Uh, you know, the ideal position is that... Uh, it should be free. And uh, we are recording those uh, grandmother's uh, fireside uh, stories. Uh, we never used to pay uh, to be told stories uh, in the evening. But uh, there is a whole aspect of uh, now the changing times. Uh, there is a production of that particular story. There is a distribution of that particular story. There is an effort that has gone into you know, packaging, uh, the whole. So that creative uh, person who has taken the pain to do that, we certainly need some uh, compensation. Uh, what we can say is that uh, there is a big role that the government should play to ensure that these particular products are as affordable as possible. Even those who have invested in the creative uh, space uh, basically are driven by the cultural and the philosophical you know, desire to share, not necessarily by the commercial aspect. And for us uh, publishers, we always say that you know, an ideal publishing house is the one that uh, takes cognizance of the fact that 
an ideal publishing house lies between what uh, some of the care called the cathedral and the stock market exchange. The cathedral in the sense that that publishing house publishes books that are not necessarily geared towards the commercial aspect of it, the cultural, the philosophical, you know, feeding society with what that society really needs to have. And then the flip side is that the stock market exchange, you know, to package, to distribute, uh, you, you spend money. So how do you recoup that investment? So it's a very uh, delicate uh, balancing act because, uh, again, we do not want it to be purely a labor of love. And I agree with uh, Kemani Wawanjiro about the need to package these products in different formats to excite the users. Uh, the comics, I know he's very passionate about comics, and I know the, the space that uh, comics uh, occupy in uh, Japan, the manga, you know, all over. So it, it's a space that we are keen to explore. We have done it in a, in a small way, but I will say, well, we have taken the challenge. We need to package in a more exciting, more inviting, more encouraging uh, kind of uh, uh, format. There is a issue of, again, tribalism has come up, but I think the young gentleman there responded very well. <coughs> it's purely a political term, so I do not want to dwell so much uh, on it. I do not think that uh, it creates uh, divisiveness. My parting shot is let us value, let us respect our languages, let us endeavor to speak them as much as possible to teach our children and by doing so we will ensure these books are bought and the whole business of publishing books depends on volumes. The more the volumes, the lower the production cost and hence the final price of the book. If you produce only 100 copies of this book, you are likely to sell it at 5,000 Kenya shillings. If you produce 10,000 copies of the same book, you are likely to sell it at 200 Kenya shillings. So uh, the ball is uh, on all of us. If we are using these books, if we are buying these books, if we are teaching our children using these books, then the volumes will increase and the price will also come down. Of course, we have also thrown the challenge to the government. It has taken up the challenge, and there is a commitment from the government that it will invest in ensuring free distribution of indigenous language books in the country by the end of this year. Thank you very much. Niweka. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. My final word. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just to add to that a little bit, you mentioned the Japanese manga, and I fully agree with with the, the, the gentleman's point about graphic novels. Eh? Other than Japan, Hausa has done very well. Okay. Uh, Hausa in Nigeria, comics are in Hausa. Most people walk around with a copy in their pocket. Usually, basic love stories. You know, not much. You know, just romantics because obviously. Uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's, also, it's also a Muslim society, and so, but um, according to a colleague of mine who has done extensive research in, in, in that part of, the, of, the, of Africa, that has made a huge impact on the people, and it has also helped promote and maintain the Hausa language in a very big way, so absolutely. Now, back in Kenya, I do remember a graphic novel that came out some years back, maybe 10, 15 years ago, produced by Sasasema Publications, yeah. which has since folded. Mm. In fact, very sadly, I met the owner, editor, whatever she was. She was an American, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, on the day she was leaving Kenya, after having failed to excite us with graphic novels, okay, uh, you know, where, what she was producing. So there, obviously there is an issue there to, 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 to tackle. Um, let me say that um, one way of promoting our languages is to regard language as a skill, because it's something we forget very much. Mm. Language is a skill, just like driving a car, or being able to use a computer, being computer literate, 
have, you know, being able to use a word, word program, you know, is a skill. That means, a skill means something you can do, others can't. Language is a skill, okay? You can translate with a doctor, that's, a, that's, that's something valuable. You can help somebody else understand, be understood, that is a skill. And so we have to think of language also in that, in that way. That knowledge of any of, and again, I won't belabor this point, there's no time to talk about why indigenous languages, they are just languages, like every other language. Yeah? As a linguist, we talk about language families, you know, Bantu languages, Nilotic, you know, Nilo-Saharan, and so forth. We don't talk about indigenous languages because languages are indigenous everywhere they are, okay? So this label of indigenous is also a bit problematic because it only applies to African languages and Latin American languages. You go to Mexico, oh, language indigenous de Mexico. You come to Africa, you say, oh, they're indigenous. But you go to Spain, Basque is a small, tiny language spoken by a very small number of people, less than the Maasai people of Kenya. But it's a language, okay? It's not called indigenous by anybody. So, but these are all political issues. And indeed, they, 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 I cannot help but belabor the point about language and politics and language and unity. The idea that language is the sole cause of, you know, conflict is very, very mistaken, okay? Language, yes, can bring people together, as Swahili does for us. But that does not mean the other conflicts have been eliminated, okay? So look at it conversely, two, two examples. On one hand, uh, we have two neighboring countries who literally speak one language in their own territory. I don't have to name them, you know them. I can say Somalia. Another one, Rwanda. Again, you know, Kenya Rwanda, everybody speaks Kenya Rwanda. If you speak Kirundi, just a, just a bonus. They are practically dialects of one another. But unfortunately, that has not helped solve political problems in those two countries. Okay? Now we move to China and Arabic, Arabic speaking part of the world. I know, and maybe people get shocked when they hear that Chinese is not one language. It's not a language, actually. It's a collection of dialects. And some of them are so distinctive from one another that some Chinese from other parts of China can un cannot understand the official standard Mandarin uh, variety of, chi of Chinese. But every Chinese person believes and says and proudly says, oh, we speak Chinese, there are some differences here and there, but we speak Chinese. It's a political, ideological p position. Arabic, same thing. An Algerian, you know, or Tunisian uh, can have difficulties, if not impossible, discussion with somebody speaking colloquial Arabic from uh, in, in Cairo. But they can read the same because the script is the same. However, due to cultural and more, most, most importantly religious affiliation, Arabic is seen as one language. Okay? But we know that is, from a linguistic point of view, it's a collection of dialects. But they're not fighting over that. They're actually, they're very happy to call each other Arabic speakers, Chinese speakers. Well, our languages, in fact, in Kenya, in my own analysis, each one of us can at least understand one of the 12, one of 12 languages only in Kenya because they are widely spoken in certain parts of the, of the country. So we have 60 languages, but I can bet that if you speak a Kenyan language, you, you need to speak only one of 12 to communicate with all the other Kenyans. So this, this discussion about language and, uh, and, and, and uh, ethnicity and, and conflict has to be taken with, a lot, of, with a, lot, a lot more subtlety because I'm afraid in Kenya we deal it very, very straightforwardly as, oh yeah, language A versus language B, ethnicity A versus ethnicity B. So um, I will end that, but on a positive note uh, in respect uh, to your question earlier, uh, I think the ray of hope lies in Kiswahili, right? Swahili is definitely, uh, I don't think we are being made fun of by being elevated, by having a Swahili day by the UNESCO. Now we have one day a year to think about Kiswahili in recognition of its status around the world. Uh, the African Union has also recently adopted Kiswahili as one of their working languages. Amazing, considering that they've had French, even Spanish, which is spoken by one single country in, Kenya, in Africa. It was on the list of working languages of the African Union. But now, officially, it means working language, you know, it means you can actually present something in Kiswahili and somebody will translate it and file it in Kiswahili or French or English or whatever it is. Very normal practice with international organizations. Shouldn't be a big deal. If you look at the budget of the European Union, right, in, in Brussels, the translation budget alone, you will 
you make your head you know, roll. In fact, that's why some countries want to leave the EU, because they think those costs are too high. Why should I be paying for people to translate my point, my MBEP's position, into 10, 20 different languages? But that's the price you have to pay for unity. You have the price you have to pay for the larger blocks. And in Africa, we have to pay financial price. You know? We cannot expect our languages to grow by themselves. That's all. Thank you. And indeed, I look forward to the time the British Council's English program will be speaking Kiswahili and English yes. to build trust and build those kind of bridges. Please join me in thanking very, very much our amazing panel, in thanking the technical team, the sign language interpreters, and all of you from the very bottom of my heart, in the language of my heart, Chavcheni Nandihi, Asanteni Sana Sana.